Hi everybody, it's James Chai here. I am going to uh, talk about some of the things that um, a few people have commented on uh, regards to uh, uh, some topics to talk about with live broadcasts. And um, I really appreciate some of the feedback already in regards to what topics to talk about. Uh, first off, what I want to say is I want to say thank you to um, uh, the tens of thousands of people who have helped to share Gordon, uh, sorry, Gordon the Disabled Bulldog story. Um, he was uh, really uh, in, a, in a very deep bind, and I mean, obviously, he's never going to know this because you know he's a dog. But um, he was definitely in a deep bind where he was uh, going to be killed tomorrow uh, due to lack of interest in his part. I am glad to say that, uh, thank goodness, um, uh, really, really happy about the fact that uh, a bulldog specific rescue is going to be adopting him so i'm really looking forward to that and we're looking forward to seeing where he's going to go on as things go uh in the future as well um it's been a it's been an interesting week for me as i spoke last time um the first time i did a broadcast i was uh pretty nervous and i'm still pretty nervous as well as um, being an introvert it's uh quite hard for me to get myself out there and i really appreciate the comments of support from like-minded introverts and, and people uh, who don't want to speak publicly. So um, I completely understand and, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy. So I, um, I appreciate the people who are watching right now and, and um, uh, you know, looking at the comments here about uh, what topics to talk about and, and, and so that people have said, uh, Nicole has said resource protecting and by resources I mean one person, uh, Jean Bobbitt. Uh, is uh, separation anxiety Jennifer Balls uh, and I and I'm just going to use first names because I'm obviously going to screw up people's last names here. Uh, obsessive ball drive, uh, really obsessive ball drive. Uh, oh, hey Zach, how are you, man? Uh, I want to say to anybody who knows Zach Scow, this man is an incredible inspiration. Uh, I remember when he came up here with his uh, incredible wife Heather to visit and uh, uh, invited me out for lunch and all that stuff. That uh, I said to Zach, I don't know how you have this ability to do live broadcasts. And Zach's like, just do it, man. So, you know, a year later, I'm doing it. <laughs> hey, brother. Uh, Zach is an amazing inspiration. Um, just one of those real people that are out there and he's not afraid to speak up. So I just want to let you guys know that there are good people in animal rescue. And, um, you know, yeah, man, uh, Zach, you, your wife. Uh, your child, and uh, anyways, all right, I'm not going to gush about it anymore. Um, so there's other topics that we're talking about. So I want, and I should have made it clear, I don't train dogs as per se. So I deal with the fact that dogs, <laughs> uh, I do, uh, um, actually, Zach, man, you know, when I left the airport that day, I, I got rear-ended in a three-car rear-ender. Uh, so a white guy hit three Chinese people in three different cards, and I was one of them, man. So um, anyhow, uh, so I just want to get back to the point. Is I don't train as per se. I evaluate the dog's psychological issues down to their root basis. So when it comes to traditional training, such as you know obedience, trick, and so forth, that is up to people who are much more skilled and much more experienced than me. And I think a lot of confusion happened in the past where people thought I was going after what they were doing. And I'm not going after what people are doing in, in that sense. My, my colleagues, I am just uh, addressing my particular niche. And unfortunately, people misinterpreted that. And they went after me quite viciously. Um, yeah, exactly, yeah, Zach. Um, and in fact, some people went after me so badly, uh, some of the trolls, that they actually published the address of my ex-wife and my my children, I'm not even going to say. Uh, so they published their address and stuff like that just to get at me for whatever bizarre reason. So that's kind of keeps me off all the time. Um, but anyhow, so we're going to just go back to some of the stuff that I do is, so I read the dogs on their nuanced behaviors and I'm reading the dogs and how they are moving their heads, uh, how they blink. Uh, blink pattern is very specific. It is uh, indicative of an emotional usually a cognitive context of processing of what's going on. So when a person is blinking, when you're looking at somebody and they're blinking, I use that same type of theory to extrapolate onto what dogs do at the dog's processing time. And I talked about it last week in regards to how dogs process at one-tenth of a trigger, uh, one-tenth of a second of their triggers. 
So when we look at the way the dog blinks, they're processing, they're blinking slowly or quickly, they're doing a double blink, those are all indicative of the way the dog is thinking. And it's, uh, it is intrinsic to the dog's personality. And the, the biggest thing that we need to remember is that dogs are sentient beings. They live, they breathe, they feel. And when it comes to emotions as well, when, so some of the comments here are regards to uh, insecurity, uh, it's regards to um, you know, separation anxiety and so forth like that. And a lot of that stuff comes from the dog's dependencies. So the dog is, what I say, is, a co uh, is an overt codependent. So, you know, codependency is a great thing to have in any type of relationship as long as it's healthy. And when it comes to codependency, dogs are codependent. They're there in an instant. They're right beside your side. They are there, you know, sleeping with you. You could be doing anything and the dog is going to follow you all around because they're loyal they're your friend they're codependent and again they are overtly codependent so they express the way they feel like gangbusters whereas human beings we are we are codependent naturally because that's why we procreate but we are covert codependents so we hide the way we feel about each other we're not going to express how much we love of someone because then it makes us look weak or silly and you know it's just not the way that we want to expose ourselves, so we protect ourselves. But then when we meet somebody that we love, we are absolutely in love with that person. And we, we are codependent. We would live and we would die for them, which is true love. And that's the basis of any kind of beautiful, gorgeous relationship. This is what our dogs do. And when it comes to our dogs, and the scientists have said, well, you know, the reason why dogs coexist and they can cohabitate with human beings is the fact that what I call emotional isomorphism. And isomorphism is, you know, two different genetic structures with different backgrounds, having similarities and traits when I speak in regards to emotional uh, isomorphism. So that again means that the cohabitation that we've had as dogs, and this is going back to the resource guarding, going to the insecurity, going back to the codependence of the dog themselves, the domesticated dog, 10,000 years ago, domestication was the dog living outdoors with the rest of us in huts and so forth like that. That's a domesticated dog existing in cohabitation through emotional isomorphism. If you were, hey, Dane Haven, how are you guys? Um, if you were to take a stray dog or an actual wild dog that lived out in the wild, no domestication, even if they lived on the outskirts of a civilization, they will not have those traits that the scientists say that dogs have in regards to cohabitation. They won't understand what we're doing. They won't understand our indicators of our movements because it's a domesticated dog that understands the cohabitation of our existence. So that's what I work with. Um, and the other thing too is with a wild dog, a stray dog, after about three generations out in the wild, three generations in, that dog will have lost all its familiarity with domestication. So if it's lost its familiarity with domestication, there's no more cohabitation. So that's been the misnomer that, uh, you know, with all due respect to the scientists and so forth like that, it's understanding the clarity of the emotional aspects. Uh, for scientists to say that dogs are able to process emotions and cognitive aspects of it, similar, uh, similar to a child, to a two, three-year-old child, is the right path. But then we need the scientists to continue going along that path. So the, again, the child, the human being, the dog is a codependent creature. So, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at this thing here. Um, so um, when it comes to that part of the way the dog on a domestic, domesticated basis, and again, I'm calling this the domesticated dog genus, right? And the genus being a, a strain of the actual species itself. So. With the wild dog, the regular canine dog, et cetera, et cetera, you're not going to get this type of cohabitation that scientists talk about because it doesn't exist. It's just not in their, their intrinsic personality. But when you come to the domesticated dog, you get the codependencies. Um, when it comes actually to dogs that are predatorial, the, the ones that I, you know, some people will say it's kind of foolish for me to do, but, but when it comes to those type of dogs, the predatorial dogs that have been beaten and and severely abused they don't have that type of affinity for cohabitation either because they don't have a trust they do not trust a human being 
They do not trust any human being because there's always going to be violence that happens towards them. So there is no cohabitation as well. So that's the scale that I, I try to uh, fight towards science to being able to understand. And that again is only one specific strain of canine, which I again called the domesticated dog, will understand cohabitation. After. So the insecurities that the dogs have are all developed on the basis of dependencies. And again, this is my theory. So again, you know, the scientists, the, the behaviorists, all these people have their own opinions. But in my uh, observations and my experience, it comes from the aspect of dependencies. So what type of dependencies do dogs have? Just like human beings, we have three types of dependencies. Uh, this is Mr. William. Hi, William. Hi, silly boy. Um, these are the three types of dependencies. Intradependency, which is just the dog and the human being. And then there is the interdependency, which is the dog being able to exist outside of its immediacy of dependency, which the which is within the family, or more so out in the public, you know, with other people being able to associate with other dogs, how open that dog is able to interdependently associate. And then there's codependency, which is the most crucial and fundamental part of any dog's existence. That codependency is what it is that causes our dog to love us. And it's what causes us to love our dogs. Overt codependency, covert codependency, simpatico, that is where we live in. So the codependency we want is a healthy amount of codependency. We don't want that part where we have the dog that becomes all of a sudden, uh, um, you know, a stalker dog where they're always following us all over the place. We want the dog to be able to trust the fact that we will always return to them in regards to the insecurities that they have, the separation anxiety when they leave, or I'm sorry, when we leave, we want our dog to understand that we will be back. And it's tough because the dog says, hey, you know what, I'm supposed to be with you. You're, you're my human, you're my everything. Why are you leaving without me? The dog has to be taught to understand that we will be back. So one of the things we always try to do, what I always try to do, and, and the dogs I get in here, I mean, I've got three Great Danes, uh, I've got a Jindo from Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation. Um, I've got little Sammy from, from uh, Taiwan. The dogs that I have, so the Jindo and the Three Danes all came to me originally quite reactive, and they're almost always dog reactive. And um, as I said before, is when Great Danes fight, they move couches. It, it, it's quite violent, and it's extremely frightening because trying to break that up is, is really difficult. But how do I get them to calm down? Is letting them understand that they all have a cohesiveness together in my family. All right, I'm a single guy, so I have to create this parental aspect of care and control and safety for all my dogs. So I have to create a security process for them so that they can understand that I trust them, I believe in them, and at the same time, I'm not gonna put up with too much uh, uh, goofiness from them. So if I teach the dog Say, for example, William, who was here just now, who's now right behind me. If I teach William that I will be back, he's not going to end up jumping around and being freaked out and, and going through the rest of my house uh, and looking for stuff out of anxiety because he doesn't know what to do. If I leave him and he doesn't understand that I'm coming back, he's going to completely freak out. He doesn't know how to console himself. So he's going to run around and run around and out of his anxiety and not knowing what to do because of the adrenaline going through his body he starts to rip things apart. So what do I do is I come back to him. And this is something that, you know, trainers and behaviorists have all said to you. They've said, hey, you know what? Give your dog five seconds and then 10 seconds, leave for 10 seconds and then leave for 15 seconds and leave for 20 seconds, leave for 30 seconds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those things are all incredibly brilliant. It's exactly what we want to do is to build up the tolerance for the dog to know that they're okay to be alone because then they get to a point where they do understand because you know everyone says that dogs understand timing of day and so forth like that and they do understand that by gauging what happens during the day the smell in the air the amount of light that's outside etc etc so they understand when time passes but we want to be able to return back to the dog in that time frame where they're just about to feel somewhat anxious and then eventually, after a certain amount of time, and a lot of people you will have all noticed, is after a certain amount of time, the dog is like, okay, well, you know, you're gone for two hours or four hours. It's still the same for me. Um, here's the one thing that a lot of people don't know is that 
that question, how do dogs process time? So the scientists are saying, you know, dogs, they understand time, they blah, 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 but we don't know what they're thinking when they're processing time. And so when it comes to the insecurity, the dog's like, oh my gosh, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? I, I don't know when you're coming back. Dogs process time through abstract memory. So abstract memory is how humans think in a much more sophisticated manner, right? We don't have, like as, as Einstein said, you know, space and time and so forth like that. Dogs process time in that format. So as time goes on, they only think of what they last remember, so to speak. So I, I say it as more like as if you, you know, in the old days, they had the slideshow projectors and they would flash one image and then it could be, it doesn't matter what the next image is, it's the next image. Even though that image, the two images could be 10 years taken apart, they're only, by the space on the projector, they're only two millimeters apart. That's how the dog processes time, by seeing those visions, those memories, those slivers of time, frame by frame by frame. So that's why the dog can always process forward and all of a sudden, if you like for example, if you're taking a dog for a walk somewhere, and you're saying, you know, every time he gets really upset, and he's really angry, and my dog freaks out and so forth like that. Because to him, that dog only processes that slide of time, that sliver of time, that frame of time, the last time he saw it. He doesn't know if it happened a week ago. He doesn't know if it happened an hour ago in the sense of he knows it happened in the past. So again, that's abstract memory. And then that also happens to the point of the insecurity. Because how do we make each time that the dog is associating with us, how do we make it each time that the dog is losing us as we walk away and we disappear from, uh, from their vision as we walk out the door, is by letting the dog know that we're coming back. So getting back to the part where the trainers and behaviors are saying extend that time period, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, absolutely brilliant. You guys are on the right path because it's that abstract processing of time. And... Um, uh, when it comes to the insecurity part of it, how do we make the dog feel better when we're leaving? We do not build it all up. We do not make it as if it's some huge story. Same thing like dropping off a child at daycare. There's those parents at helicopter and they keep coming back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And then what and then what do the daycare workers are like, oh gosh, I wish they would just leave. And then what do they tell the parents? Just leave. Just just walk away, say goodbye, and leave. Same thing with our dog. When we leave, they know we love them. They know that they love us. But we still have to be firm like a parent and say, for example, William, I'm leaving. I'll be back. And then we leave and then we come back in that time frame. And when we do come back, don't make it a humongous big deal, right? Because some dogs will jump up and they'll be all frantic. Like, oh, where have you been? Where have you been? Where have you been? Come back to them. Crouch down. Squat down to their level and let them find that way to be with you again. Uh, sorry, I'm just looking at this thing here. Um, let them know that when you come back, you're not making it a hyper thing. Give them about 10 to 15 seconds of time of your calmness when you come back. And they're gonna jump around. They're gonna jump around, jump around. If you need to hold their collar, uh, and the dogs here, I, I don't have collars on them, but I will then squat down and I'll have to kind of hold them by the back of the neck and just keep them still so that they're not jumping everywhere. So I'll bring them back down and I'll just spend time with them. And if there's another dog that tries to come because I have the five there, I will physically push one out of the way or three or four of them out of the way. And for me, uh, these are big dogs, hundred, you know, 140 to 180 pounds. I will push them away and sometimes I have to shove them away really quite hard. You can't avoid it. It's just the way it is. So I'll push them away and I'll say, it's William's turn. And then I'll spend that 15 seconds to William. And then the next dog will be a hyper and hyper. And then I'll go to the next dog. And I'll always go along the way of seniority from when the dog came into my home. So if it's a foster, if it's a rescue, I will work with that dog in the order of seniority. So you union people out there, uh, you're going to be happy about that. So we're going to do with the senior dog first. So for example, um, you know, I'll deal with... Uh, the one dog and then the second dog that came into the home, third dog, fourth dog, fifth dog, and then I'll spend time with them. And as the other dogs, say for example, the first dog is like, hey, I want to come back to you and have attention, I will push him back and I'll say, it's William, you had your turn, now it's Minky's turn, for example. And then I'll go down the line and spend time with them. And then they understand that when I come back, 
that their anxiety and their fear of being left behind is being taken care of and being coddled like a hug by the fact that I'm addressing the fact that they themselves felt anxiety. Where have you been? Just hold me, dad. Hold me, dad. Hold me, dad. So I come back to spend the 15 seconds, even 20 seconds, depending on how many dogs you have. And I spend the time with them. If you have, for example, just one dog, which I think is a horrible thing. I think you all should have five dogs each. Um, if you have one dog, then you spend the time with that one dog, with your dog. So say, for example, uh, William is my only dog here. And so I spend time with him and I'll hug him and I'll hold him and I'll keep my hands still. I'll keep my energy still. So that way, when they know I come back to the home, I'm not hyper. So they go, oh, okay, dad's pretty calm. Spend the time with them, then I'll let them go, and then I'll come back again whenever, for example, William wants attention. I will push him away after that first initial amount of, of, of affection, push him away, let him do whatever he wants to do, and then I'll call him back to me. I won't, I'll either go to him or I'll call him back to me. And a lot of times when I call him back, because he still hasn't had his anxiety satiated after the hug, because he's like, where have you been for a gazillion years? Abstract memory, right? So where have you been for a gazillion years? I'll bring him back to me. Yeah, yeah, Nicole. Like literally 15 seconds. Well, because if you if you want five, uh, if you, you, you can gauge it yourself to begin with. But again, when a dog is really super hyper, it's because of the anxiety that they have. It is the abandonment issue. It is, why did you leave without my permission? Why did you leave without taking me? So if you do it a certain short time frame, because again, I do it even with my dogs. I will keep it just a short time frame with them. Because if I do too much, uh, okay, I'll, I'll get to you in a few seconds there, Dane Haven. Uh, I, I'm going to do it for 15 seconds because if I do it too much time, then it feeds into their codependency. So we want to, I want to just give them just enough amount of time so that they feel okay. And this also works, yeah, five dogs, Rita. Uh, so that way it gives them just the right amount of time just to take the edge off of them. And then I bring them back in for some affection or else sometimes I'll give them some treats. I don't usually because, uh, you know, I'm trying to get my stuff all dealt with. But when I have some calm time for myself when I put stuff away, then I will then give them a treat or else I will give them a hug and then they feel better. Um, uh, sorry, what did Dane Haven say here? Um, uh, okay, why by seniority? Okay, so the reason why by seniority is because the dogs know that. Going back to abstract memory as well, the dogs know when and who came in at all times. And if you notice that being that part of a group of dogs, if you notice that when you do get a bunch of dogs, Either it's going to be the rambunctious, really emotionally bold dog that's going to start rushing out the door, but the other dogs that have been there senior time-wise, they already know, oh, okay, well, then it's my turn next. And then it's my turn next. Then it's my turn next. They know that. So we want to establish that because then when we do establish seniority, the dogs know we have control of our family. Um, I don't call the dogs pack animals. I, I loathe that word. I would call them a group our group but instead I call it a family because they're familial and we need to be their parents because again if they're two three old children we want we want I want my dogs to understand that they're being cared for um, when it comes to the seniority side of things they do understand where they are in the home believe it or not it's the same thing if a dog passes away uh, the other dogs know that that dog has passed away they know something's missing and that's the that key point uh, any what other questions here in regards to um, uh, abandonment issues? If somebody wants to, somebody super fast who can type, uh, you have other questions on that part. Um, uh, let me just see here. I, I want to talk about hackles. Then let's talk about hackles. Uh, pillow erection, right? The the dog fur rising up along the spine and um, you know a, 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 a friend of mine once called yes family right a, a friend of mine once called. Uh, pillow erection, full pillow erection, full mohawk, right? You know, the mohawk along the back, the front of the uh, the hackles and the back of the hackles, et cetera, et cetera. So scientists are saying, th this is what just drives me nuts because it's incorrect path that scientists have gone on and continue to be married to because it's hard to get past the uh, the credentials of a PhD when it comes to the uh, um, humanity of dogs and the compassion of dogs. So uh, scientists say, you know, it's out of stress, it's out of anxiety, it's out of fear. And that's the scratch of the surface that these guys have here 
Uh, you're welcome for that. Uh, thank you for your wonderful. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so when it comes to the hackles, you're gonna have the front hackles and the back hackles on the dog's spine, and then peel erection the full mohawk. Uh, and, and another thing that I've read as well, as well in regards to why do the hackles raise, uh, is it's to make the dog look bigger. So that is about as silly of an explanation as you can get. The hackles raising on the dog raises up, what, quarter inch? Half an inch at the most? The other dog is not gonna see that. The other dog is gonna go, so what? And because the dogs are empathic, em empathetic, they know that the hackles raised on the other dog is indicative of conscious issues that the dog is experiencing. All right, so uh, just loosely is the front hackles is consciously consciously rooted fear. But then the fear goes in a bit deeper, but it's a consciously rooted aspect. When the hackles go up on the back of the dog's spine, it's subconsciously rooted. And it usually indicates worry, concern, and sometimes curiosity based out of that fear. Hackles in the front, it's a cognitive process. It's, consci it's consciously... It's consciously, consciously, anyways, you all know what I'm talking about. It's consciously rooted. So the dog is actually thinking of the fear that they're experiencing as they see something that is coming towards them that's somewhat intimidating. So the dog is worried. The dog is going, ooh. That's why you see a lot of dogs who are quite emotional. The back hackles raise. When you see dogs that are more logically driven, the front hackles raise because the dog is thinking. The front hackles raised and the dog's thinking, okay, the last experience that I had was pretty darn scary with this dog that I didn't understand and I got attacked and now I'm afraid and now I'm afraid even more so and then it starts to show up physiologically on the dog, front hackles raising. On the back hackles, says the dog, for, for all exp explanations, the dog is worried. I'm concerned that something's going on, I don't know how to pronounce it, I don't know what to do, I don't know what, where I'm gonna go, I don't know how I'm gonna be protected, please help me, please help me, please help me. So the back hackles go. So, if this was an aspect to scare the other dog, it's not gonna happen because the dogs, the, 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 the other dogs are gonna see and go, you're afraid, you're afraid of me. The dogs aren't gonna happen on, on the end. Sorry, what's this one, my male eldest dog uh, does not, only not only my eldest male not only does the hackles in the back but he starts shedding like crazy immediately i'm not sure what you mean by uh, by shedding virginia um or do you mean shaking uh, i'll just wait for you to to, to um uh, respond to that um so yeah so it's the hackles so that's where it is so that's a fear-based aspect so when you see your dog's hackles raise it means that they are cognitively thinking about it. Either it's consciously rooted or it's subconsciously rooted, but it's still based there. So how did I learn all this stuff? Okay, so here, oh, stress shedding. Uh, I, I don't know if it's stress shedding as per se. It might just be, you know, uh, I, I would need a little bit more information on that because I, I don't really want to make assumptions of what, uh, what's being uh, commented there. Hey, Jason. Um, so it's it's more the point then, again, it, it, it's where the dogs is based on. So the dogs that I've dealt with, again, they're predatorial dogs. Uh, these are dogs, uh, like I said, you know, 180 plus pound dog, dragged a shelter worker into his kennel, causing wounds requiring 42 stitches. Uh, another Great Dane, um, you know, 10 plus years old, uh, um, you know, dragged in a uh, a, a, a large woman off the couch at the foster's home uh, in in, uh, in Alabama, bringing her onto the floor, inflicting wounds requiring 67 stitches. Um, you know, other dogs that are reactive to each other. Like those, the two dogs that I'm talking about, you know, Walter and, and Nero, these are dogs that are at that echelon of, um, of, uh, uh, of danger, of predatorial behavior. These are dogs that people call unpredictable. They don't raise their hackles. None of these guys have ever raised their hackles when they first come to me for the first few weeks or months of their lives with me because they need to hide their fear. So this is why it's more of a conscious aspect of a dog. They're much more uh, uh, present in their existence than scientists are giving them. So from my end, I don't see the hackles raised on any of these guys, especially in the beginning, because to give it away 
means that then it shows that fear aspect. That's why I was saying earlier that the dogs understand what the hackles mean. So it doesn't mean anything for them to raise their hackles because it doesn't say anything like I'm bigger, or stronger, or more scarier than you. It means absolutely nothing because they understand how it, how it feels. It's the same thing as if you see somebody looking on the floor all the time, they're always nervous. You're like, okay, that person's nervous and maybe I'll help them. Uh, or, you know, what we, what we should do, we it should help people anyways, compassion-wise speaking. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to the predatory aspects of these uh, these guys like uh, like Walter and, uh, and like uh, Nero who's passed away and all that stuff, it's really addressing the fact of how they feel and when they are heightened in that position of, uh, of psychology, they're not going to express what's going on. And, um, uh, you know, um, it's, it's, it's really really darn scary because uh, uh, I mean like I said before uh, last broadcast I'm here by myself um, that's the thing um, okay so so that's where the hackles are that's the, uh, the so it comes back to the part of about being insecure about uh, resource guarding humans and so forth like that our dogs need to know that they're feeling protected so you know the hackles going up means that they're afraid how do we deal with that we go over there and we let them know that they're okay. I always put my hand on the back of our uh, of my dog or dogs who's ever concerned and just keeping my hand there to let them feel that they're okay, that they feel me there beside them. So if they're worried, I'm sitting there beside them, I'm standing there beside them, they feel calmer and they feel that they can trust me that I've got their back. And that's what we want to do again when we leave the home. We want the dog to know that we're coming back even though they feel that they've been abandoned and that we're that I'm got their back that I'm returning back to them uh, you know I want to bring up another thing I'm, I, I've got like over a hundred topics like you know why a dog licks their face the front the back uh, the sides everything like that why they look to the left why they look to the right what what their tail behavior is uh, uh, you know I, I want to correct that 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 um, uh, that incorrect application that um, a certain couple of accreditation uh, affiliations call uh, tail set, you know, the dog's tail behavior. It's tail behavior. It's not a tail set. It's not S-E-T, right? Not a tail set. Because a tail set is like a dining set, a plate, a dinner set. You know, you got your, your plates and your dishes. That's a set. That's an immovable, un, uh, right? It's an intransient uh, 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 pattern. So when I talk about the dog moving their tail, it's their behavior. And you see the dogs doing the figure eights and so forth like that. Uh, you see the dog moving their tail at the top, and some people say, oh, the dog's super friendly, super friendly. A lot of times with the dogs that I deal with, it is not friendliness. It's uh, an actual, and a few of you guys who have hired me know that it is actually subterfuge. And that subterfuge is to belie the fact that the dog is afraid. So then again, we go back to the codependency part of it. How do we make the dog feel safe? Well, then we again address the fact when we see the dog's tail moving. And the, the, vari the variations of the tail wag is just incredible language. It's so gorgeous when you see a dog's tail move. Um, but it is indicative, again, when the tail is up and, and it's moving in a certain pattern. You'll notice, too, and, and it's like food for thought. When you look at your dogs and you, they're looking at you and the tail is up, and they don't, and the tail stops. Just say something to them, and the tail starts wagging. That doesn't mean that the dog is happy. It means the dog is processing what you're saying. I learn all this stuff. So, and, and, I, and I'm gonna um, I'll probably finish this off in a little bit. So, I want to go out and, and, and just kind of describe all this stuff, and where I came from, and, and how I learned all this. So, I have zero training. Okay, so I, I've been attacked for having zero training by trainers and behaviorists, those those people and all that stuff, uh, which I understand, I can understand. So that's why I want to make it clear that I'm not out here to train or do obedience training or anything like that. And I freely refer people to other trainers and behaviors and say, you know what, I deal with the, the psychological. Now, if you want obedience and so forth, go to go to so-and-so and so-and-so, and so, right? Um, uh, so 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 that's where uh, that's where I want to go. Um, shoot, I just kind of lost my train of thought because I, I didn't want. To, oh yeah, right. So I have no background in training whatsoever. I essentially fell into it uh, with my first Great Dane, my beloved Great Dane, which is in my profile picture. He's the one in the wheelchair. Uh, he became paraplegic when I adopted him. Uh, I did not know he had issues at all. Because I'm thinking, well, I'm just adopting a, a, a Great Dane, and he's five and a half years old. Yada yada. And I was taking him out for a walk uh, in the neighborhood that I used to live in. 
uh, from my apartment building, and he would lunge at people suddenly, right? Everyone talks about the unpredictability of dogs, which I kind of mentioned last week, uh, last, I'm sorry, last broadcast. Um, and he was lunging at people, and people wearing baseball caps, uh, women with scarves on their heads and other aspects of it, uh, you know, and it was, to me, seemed random. And he would, he would freak out, and so I started phoning Great Dane breeders. I have started phoning uh, Great Dane rescues, emailing everyone saying, what am I supposed to do? What should I do? What should I do? I have no experience with the dogs. What do I do? What do I do? And they were saying, well, use treats and use treats and try this and try that. Everything I tried did not work at all. Uh, I had gotten in, in contact with Elaine Dixon, who runs, uh, who used to run uh, New Hope for Danes, which is Canada's oldest Great Dane rescue. And she said to me, well, what do you think, James? I'm like, well, you know, this is what I think, but I'm probably wrong. And she goes, well, just try it. Just try it. Even though Elaine has rescued over 5,000 Great Danes in her lifetime, I was like, okay, she's just basically fluffing me off and telling me to, you know, to leave. Uh, But I went, you know, what the heck, I might as well try. What's going to hurt? So that's what I started doing with, with Lincoln is I started working with Lincoln and I started talking to Lincoln like he was a child in comprehension, but as if he was an adult in perception, always keeping in mind the fact that he's also a predator. And Lincoln was about 154 pounds, so he's got a bite strength PSI around about five, 600 range of that. And so I was always cautious of that. And uh, I can tell you, if I had gone through traditional training, uh, especially the stuff that I see now, I hear now about uh, from some, some, uh, some well-known trainers uh, throughout North America, if I'd gone through training in that aspect of it, I guarantee you I would be deathly afraid of dogs. I would be afraid of a 50-pound dog, much less a 180-pound or 220-ish pound dog. I'd be deathly afraid of these dogs, and I would never have explored my intuitive aspects of working with the dogs. Uh, and you know the interesting thing is I got contacted yesterday by a trainer in the UK, uh, Paul, and um, he, he runs a, a facility out there and he said, you know, I, I'm really interested in what you're doing and I just want to know how you did it and will I ever be proficient as you are. And I said to him, absolutely 100%. Just because I can do this and I can read dogs at two-tenths of a second doesn't mean that you can't do it. And so we started talking about a particular dog that he was working with that was aggressive and that he was having issues with. And I said to him, okay, so what are you doing? You know, we kind of exchanged back and forth. And he said something called, uh, I think it's called intermediate bridging. See, I, so I don't know these terminologies. So they, 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 he said inter, intermediate bridging. So I had to Google it and I looked it up and said, okay, so, so what intermediate bridging or bridging or terminal bridging or whatever it's called is um, to react to the dog after they've reacted. So basically, you know, you ask the dog to do something, and until when the dog does it, then you reward the dog either by treat or by praise. And of course, I always go with praise. And then that's what you call intermediate bridging. So you then bring it closer and closer and closer to the point where you start seeing the dog's behavior in real time. Because I said to him, have you ever noticed though when you're doing intermediate bridging with that dog or any of the other dogs, that suddenly you start kind of anticipating or seeing what was going to happen beforehand? And he said, yeah. And I said, that is your intuition. That is what I'm doing. That is what you're doing. I'm just giving you the label to it now. When I work with owners, like, uh, you know, Sylvia, you're, you're there. I see your name. Um, when I've worked with owners, I've said the same thing. They're like, well, how do you do this, James? How do you do this? I say, I'll teach you. And these people learn how to do it. Owners learn how to do it with their own dogs because they know their own dogs intuitively. They know... Just like you know how to finish the sentences of the people that you know very well, it's the same thing that we do with dogs. So with this trainer in the UK, uh, Behaviors, I said the same thing to him was, you already got the gift, man. We all have it. All us human beings, we all have it. And I don't care what anyone says. Oh, you know, I don't know. Uh, We all have it. Trainers and behaviors uh, who, who I consult with, they all start off going, ah, you know, you're crazy, man. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm just going to follow you. And then I start coaching them on embracing and, and really celebrating that intuition coupled with their experience. And then they're just like, I get it. I get it. And then they go off and they become rock stars with their owners. And at the end of the day, that means another life is saved. Another life is saved. Um, hey, Vicky. So, um, yeah, so it comes to the intuition, the ability for us to see what's going on. Same thing again, like you finish the sentences of other people. That's what I started doing with my dogs. And when I work with the dogs that are predatorial, 
because I've seen the pictures, I've heard the uh, uh, graphic stories have happened because I always ask, um, I have to be on alert because if I do get attacked, um, these guys are quite significant and uh, anybody knows uh, Jason Carrier who's, who's watching uh, a good friend of mine, he knows and I've said this to him before and I've said this to other people as well, my fear has always been will I bleed out? Will I be able to get to my cell phone and if I can get to my cell phone, uh, will there be too much blood that I can't call 911? Um, it's, it's, it's extremely frightening. It's like living with a lion and a, and, a, and a serial killer all at once is what I've always said to people. So I have to pay attention to what's going on. I have to intuitively trust my own uh, evolutionary instincts. You all have that inside of you. If you didn't have it inside of you, there would be no way that you could do what I'm asking you to do with your dogs, like Otto Lim uh, with his dog, Derby. Um, you know, uh, the people who are in my closed group, uh, my closed reactive dog group, uh, and anyone's welcome to join that. All the stuff, if you go to my website where you uh, look under the tab, uh, help for your dog, you'll see I've read people's, just their descriptions and the photos of their dogs, and I've given them an accuracy evaluation that you'll never get from any anybody any of my colleagues because of the depth of information that's out there it's using our intuition and when it comes to reading people's uh, 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 descriptions of their dogs and so forth like that it's the same thing that we get when we have someone send us a text right say, say you start going out with somebody and you're dating her or him okay uh, you start dating the person and in the beginning you're kind of like oh I like this person and she likes me and, and all that stuff and then she sends you a text but it's a kind of an odd text and you're like because there's no emotions in it and you're thinking to yourself what does this text mean is she telling me to, to that she wants to hang out or is she me that she doesn't want to hang out and we start reading into the text and we're trying to figure out okay what words does she use uh, you know uh, you know how is it organized how is it structured where's her sentencing structure where's her period where's her grammatical her, her syntax and how does the rhythm of that language flow that's our intuition we can start figuring it out. Same thing as some, you know. Same thing with our dogs. We start figuring that part out when we start committing to the intuitive side of us and trusting our intuition. When you start, uh, when you stop trying to struggle with it, you start accepting it and you start learning. Um, another thing I want to say too is I want to thank again, and I thanked him last time as well. I want to thank him because I have his book here as well. Uh, um, this is uh, hopefully you can see this if it's not reversed. Uh, this is Alan Shelton. Uh, so there's no glare on it. Uh, Awakened Leadership. Uh, Alan is uh, Alan and his wife Justine, which I mentioned last uh, my first broadcast. Uh, Alan is an incredible man. Uh, he is a uh, he is a corporate coach. Uh, he has uh, worked for Amazon as a VP. He has uh, worked with Nike, Calvin Klein, Van, and he hasn't just worked with the little people, you know, like us. He's actually worked. Uh, oh, sorry, Christina. Um, he, it, uh, Christina, it'll be uh, it'll be posted later on anyhow, so you'll be able to watch it after the point. I'm I'm sorry, I, I I'm not really technologically uh, uh, savvy, even though I am Asian. Uh, so uh, when it comes to uh, to Alan's work and all this stuff, he he's worked with the CEOs of these companies. He's worked with again Vans and so forth like that. So if you have an opportunity, get that book, uh, Awakened Learning. Um, uh, sorry, Awakened Leadership it is um, it is just um, it is just an amazing uh, book, and he talks about things that he developed um, as a child and what he saw, and it's talking about this community that we have, this world that we live in, that we are all, as we keep saying, we're connected, but we're connected beyond that. Uh, if we don't, if we don't look at life on a linear basis. If we look at life on a uh, on a quantum aspect of it, if we look at life on a more um, plasmic kind of way. On, on you know, like think of it if, instead of just thinking in a, in a trunk of, of thoughts, think of it more as such a cloud that has some sort of direction. Anyways, uh, it's it's kind of a complicated topic that I'm talking about here. Um, but yeah, so I want to thank Alan for for uh, you know being beside me and coaching me in that sense. I mean, him and his wife are out in uh, Hawaii. But he uh, he has been guiding me, and he's going to help me move forward into promoting my work out further into the rest of uh, the world. Um, so uh, again, Alan, I, I want to thank you uh, very much. Um, there's other people out there that I unfortunately just can't remember at this point in time. 
Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great influence. Uh, I want to give another shout out to Stephen Elliott as well uh, for um, uh, just being a really cool person. Probably one of the first trainers, behaviors. I mean, the guy's got a degree and everything. Uh, one of the first trainers, behaviors, uh, who actually approached me openly and said, hey, man, you know what? What you're doing is absolutely crazy and bizarre, but would you explain it to me? And, um, you know, that kind of humility from a guy like Stephen is, is such a lovely thing to, to get. And that's what we all need. So, um, you know, I want to make it clear to uh, trainers and behaviors. I'm not out here to take your job away, to take your money away, to take anything away. I'm here to help. And if I can help coach you and help you with the psychological evaluations of your dogs uh, that you're working with your clients, that means that dog gets saved. Uh, again, go to my website, arfarfbarkbark.com. Look on the tab, uh, either the testimonials tab or under the four, uh, sorry, under the tab that says help your dog. And then you'll be able to see the stuff that I've read of people's um, things, of uh, their dogs and so forth, and given a remedy and diagnosis in, in a matter of, you know, you know it, it, it takes me like under one minute to read a dog in person. Uh, when I read their the descriptions, uh, it takes me about five to seven minutes to do so. Uh, in the beginning, when I had Lincoln, my dear Lincoln, back in 2000, um, you know, 14, 15 and all that stuff, it would take me about an hour and 20 minutes to do what I can do now in under a minute. So that means that you all can do it yourselves. And if you ever have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll reply based on, on, you know, my time frame and all that. And uh, I appreciate everyone watching this. If you have any questions, again, you know, about the hackles raising, I hope that has given you all um, some clarity as to what it really means. Same with processing time. I hope that gives you all some clarity to what it really means. Uh, the tell behavior, we may touch on that some future time. Um, I may, uh, may be bold enough uh, next broadcast to talk about uh, uh, and some incorrect information that um, that well-known behaviorist uh, Temple Grandin has uh, erroneously uh, commented in regards to cows and the light and the dark uh, to fear aspects that uh, she has uh, published in her uh, article uh, paper with Tufts University. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, the, it, it's incorrect what uh, she has gone and uh, spoken about. So um, again, you understand what it is with the tail behavior. We'll get to that later on. Uh, the hackles, you all understand that now. Again, it is not a, it is a fear base, but beyond that surface, it is actually cognitively processed as emotions on conscious or subconscious level. And again, you know, we can talk about the full pillow erection. Uh, and then, um, yeah, processing time abstract. Again, like a slideshow. And if you know it, and you think of it as a slideshow, how the dog processes things, you're going to kick some serious butt when you're working with your dog next time. Because then when you go, well, what does my dog remember? Well, it's because that impression that they got wasn't wasn't a beautiful enough impression for the dog to remember or emotionally relevant impression. Um, and always, always, always use your dog's name. Always, always use your dog's name. And I want to thank everybody for, uh, for checking in and all that stuff. Um, you know, I'll keep doing this. If you have any ideas or topics that you want to talk about, please comment in this thread, and then I'll keep that in mind next time. And if you have any questions, um, yeah, just feel free to ask and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to end this off out of my nervousness and just say uh, this was still another freaky uh, uh, live broadcast. And, um, you know, uh, for those of us who are introverts, uh, I just want to say, you know, here's one for the team, and um, uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep doing this, and uh, you know, I, I'm just want to thank everybody, anyways. Okay, so um, uh, for you all, thank you so much for your kindness, thank you so much for loving your dogs, and um, you know, please embrace humanity and please be kind to not just your dogs, but to other people. And sometimes it gets pretty hard to be kind to other people. Um, but, you know, please be kind. And look at, hello, Mr. William. Hi, silly boy. And we'll, you know what we'll do next time? We'll talk about why does a dog lick you in the face. We'll talk about that. And uh, uh, you're going to be blown away why, why it happens. Um, and, and again, all the stuff works because I've done it myself. I've experienced it with the predators. I, I understand what's going on because if I was wrong 
I would be dead or critically injured. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, when you get bitten by a dog whose teeth, like Walter's teeth, are are half the thumb size. So when they impact, not only do they go through your skin, like you can see parts from other dogs and everything, not only do they go through your skin, but they create deep bruising that takes two to three weeks to surface as well. Um, so you can imagine being killed by a dog uh, that big is, is quite frightening. Okay, so uh, I got to stop rambling. Um, William is giving me the look. Hello, silly boy. Hi, silly boy. Even the tone of voice that I use, right? Hi, Walla. Hi, silly boy. Hi, William. All right, everybody, take care, and um, thank you so much. Bye-bye.